Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. Each year, the University of Pennsylvania's uh, Think Tanks and Civil Societies program releases a ranking of global think tanks. It's called the Global Go-To Think Tank Index, a ranking of thousands from around the world. And the Wilson Center ranks in the top 10 both domestically and internationally and is number one in regional studies and institutional collaboration. So playing off those strengths, we're introducing a new initiative where the center is going to be focusing a spotlight on four cross-regional issues. One of those is great powers, competition, and cooperation. And joining us today are the point persons for that initiative, Matt Rajansky and Robert Daly. Matt is uh, the director of the Kennan Institute, which focuses on Russia and Eurasia. And Robert Daly is director of the Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. Gentlemen, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, John. So this notion of, of great powers competition, uh, who qualifies? Just depends on who we ask. <laughs> uh, well, I'm asking you. <laughs> uh, insofar as the focus is primarily on China and the United States, China's answer is certainly that there are only two. Uh -huh. uh, Beijing and, and Washington. Uh, but I don't think that that's Washington's answer. Washington, I think, would have a broader definition, right? Right. So if you look at the uh, national defense strategy that was rolled out a couple of years ago uh, under then Secretary Jim Mattis and the national security strategy uh, around the same time, uh, you know, these are Trump administration documents, but by the same token, the concepts and the thinking in them tend to both predate the administration that rolls them out and usually live long beyond uh, one or even two presidential terms. Uh, these describe principally China and Russia together as great power or near peer rivals and adversaries. Uh, perhaps more conservatively, competitors uh, of the United States uh, and talk about a whole uh, set of uh, global geographic, but also kind of conceptual and technological spaces in which these great power rivals or adversaries are our principal challenges. And, and the big jump here is, of course, from a framing of U.S. national security that was principally about countering terrorism mm -hmm. and kind of non-state threats uh, as recently as a decade ago. So if we went from Cold War to terrorism, to now. Can we define what now is? Well, it is, people are, are sort of rallying around this great power competition. That is, that is what you hear repeatedly, and not only in the United States. But I don't think we really have a common understanding of what that means yet. And is, for your first question, who's included? Certainly, if you look at the documents, it's primarily Russia and China. But you also have a framing, especially from the United States point of view, in which we're tending to lump competitors large and small into something which sometimes looks like an axis of, what, un unpleasantness? Uh, we, which includes perhaps Russia and China, that Entente, but also at times Iran, and Iran mm -hmm. and Russia and China just completed uh, joint exercises together. Uh, and in some tellings of this, it also includes Turkey. And so are we talking about a China-US competition? Is it the US and this Russia-China Entente? Or is it the U.S. and whatever we see by way of our allies against this emerging uh, entente of nations that we see as, as having undesirable or incommensurable strategic aims? And I think this is still taking shape. I'll go ahead, Matt. I'm sorry. Yeah, so what's frustrating to me about the framing, and, and in a way you can't blame the authors because they're coming from you know, the security establishment here in the United States from, you know, Defense Department, National Security Council. Their job is to think about threats, but it is a very threats first framing. When you're a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. That's exactly right, of, of the 21st century. You know, when the reality is, uh, what matters, of course, is what people want, what makes life worth living for humanity, uh, and that is usually much less threat oriented. That's a, that's a fear uh, driven conception uh, and much more ambition or even greed oriented. What leads to economic growth? What leads to human health and happiness? Uh, what leads to freedom, right? Uh, going back to the formulation from the George W. Bush administration, a freedom agenda, uh, but the kind of freedoms that everyone can agree upon, not necessarily political freedoms, freedom to travel, freedom to practice your religion, freedom to speak your mind, etc. cetera, uh, freedoms that exist in cyberspace, right? These are clearly things that are gonna matter enormously. And if you, if you take that framing of the problem, uh, it doesn't very easily boil down to one or two or three, you know, great power actors. Uh, you know, a billion people residing in the Indian subcontinent are going to have an awful lot to say. Uh, Eurasia as such, as a kind of concept, as a crossroads of all kinds of economies, civilizations, uh, information spaces is going to be enormously important. Um, and then the question of kind of state versus society, regime versus people, right? We, I think, unintentionally but implicitly uh, give 
uh, great authority to regimes, including regimes we don't like very much, authoritarian regimes, yeah. uh, by describing you know our competitors in the security space as being the big players, as opposed to describing the people who live in these societies, uh, whose basic desires and outlooks may not be that different from our own, just phrased in a kind of different lexicon, uh, as actually being the folks who matter. We, we also have this tendency to good guys and bad guys. Well, this is right. I mean, you just mentioned this phrase, the security space. For a lot of this proponents of great power competition, there is no security space. It's all encompassing. It's security to the exclusion of all else with no recognition, and I would strongly second Matt on this, that freedom, while an essential good, all governments must provide it, is nevertheless a relative good. And it does have to be balanced against other goods, including the right to interact. Relative to other goods or relative within the context of a nation and how it defines freedom? Both. But it's, it's, the point is that it's not absolute. And in the American case, because of our own particular history and culture, and I think probably because of the experience of the world, uh, Second World War and the Cold War, we do have this tendency to say, not only is this a competition between nation states, but this is the final battle of, of good and evil. This mm -hmm. is, it, there's always this you know, sort of end times Apocalyptic of, of, need to call all enemies evil empires. And it's this totalizing narrative uh, which tends to not only uh, take our attention away from the sorts of relative goods that Matt was just describing, but it's those narratives also are what people and governments and other nations respond to. And so one of my concerns with this great power narrative is that it's only being viewed in terms of security uh, in a winner-take-all, good versus evil context, which is keeping our attention off of the many nuances, contingencies, and relative goods that governments are supposed to provide. It's also an attempt to claim the, the moral high ground. And is it successful? How does the world view the United States in that regard currently? Well, you have to get down to cases. Uh, the United States compared Let's talk about what China and Russia. Let's them. take those two for examples. Well, again, this is an illustration of what I think is uh, a complex interplay, but nonetheless a significant gulf between regime and society, right? So the, the Russian state, uh, the security establishment in Russia, the political leadership of the country has a certain view of the United States. That view is at the same time, I think, uh, very flexible and very pragmatic on a lot of issues. For instance, there's an open offer from the Kremlin right now to extend the current New START uh, Strategic Nuclear Arms uh, Reduction Treaty uh, another five years from its uh, expected expiration in February of 2021. I mean, that's a pretty incredible offer from a Russian leader to say, you know, sort of no questions asked, we'll do a clean extension of the existing treaty. Uh, at the same time that the Russians are building up their nuclear weapons, their advanced delivery capabilities, precisely in order to intimidate and deter the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's setting aside all the other conflict areas that we know about, right? Election interference, Syria, Ukraine, uh, where we have clear and very significant disagreements. There's a, a kind of reflection of that, but through a, a very different lens in Russian society, which is that uh, some of the enmity and hostility is of much longer duration, right? People who distrust America today, you know, maybe tapping into feelings that uh, were ingrained into them in the 1960s and 70s in the case of older generations, uh, but or even more recently in, you know, the, the 2000s in the case of younger Russians who have only known the post-Cold War era, there's plenty of reason for uh, ingrown hostility, um, and that changes much more slowly because that's about human experience. They need something real to hook onto that shows Americans can be my friends. You know, uh, travel to the United States, which has become very, very hard. Uh, employment in an international company, which, thanks to sanctions, has become very, very hard. Uh, exposure to American culture. Still there, for sure, but you know, Russia is a major culture generator, as is, is China mm -hmm. in its own right. There's even a so-called Russian internet. And I'm not talking here about trolls and bots and hackers. I'm literally talking about the Russian language domain and the internet. It's one of the largest nodes, probably next to China, right. and then the English language sort of node on the internet. So Russian society, I think, is not necessarily innately hostile to Americans or to the United States. Uh, I think they pick lots of policy disagreements with what American governments do, uh, but there's a a kind of a, a kind of stickiness, a kind of slow moving lag time to some of the built up distrust and the enmity and the distance uh, that has now taken root between our two societies. That's a huge policy problem. And many of the nations that are affected by great power competition and cooperation are simply not caught up in questions of good and evil and who has the moral high ground. They have interests and they're complex. 
Uh, you've heard me tell this story, but I think it was an important one. Last week, we had four sinologists, China experts right. from Kazakhstan, who were here, and they spent about an hour and a half speaking with the Kissinger Institute and Kennan about the various ways in which they're caught between China and its economic power and Russia and that specific history and, and security demands. They were speaking about the, the complexity of this and their need to balance. And they were also speaking about the fact that the United States uh, and the West more broadly is their institutional model in terms of their aspirations, whatever they might have to balance, their aspirations are more Western. And toward the end of this discussion, I said to them, okay, well, so what do you want? You're here in Washington, what do you want from the United States? And I thought they were going to say, don't ignore us. Get more involved uh, to balance against China, to balance against Russia, to help us imitate uh, American institutions. And of course, that would be an answer uh, that would be morally as well as strategically flattering to Americans. That's not what they said. And these, these were young experts. They said, don't do to us what you did to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I said, I thought you were going to say, don't ignore us. And they said, we would rather that you ignored us than that you paid attention to us in the wrong way and left us holding the bag. And so there's no good or evil. There's no moral high ground in this. Right. They have to navigate complex situations. There are better so, or worse outcomes. Right. And so right. this great power dynamic that we're discussing now, and I think in some ways, rightly so, has the danger of being oversimplified and of being a way to try to blow through the tremendous complexity which we're, in fact, confronting. Mm -hmm. This, if I can, this is a long-standing problem with policy made from imperial capitals which is it tends to instrumentalize smaller and less well-resourced players in the international system. Whether it is fundamentally a threats-driven lens or it's an opportunity expansionist ambition-driven lens, um, you can look at either side of the coin, right? Uh, a country that finds itself in between uh, being viewed as a bridge. Wow, that's a really positive phrase, a bridge to some place. Yeah, but the thing is bridges get walked on, right? Or it's viewed as a battlefield, right? And this, is, this has been exactly the problem for Ukraine, right? It was either viewed as this bridge between Europe and Russia, whatever it was in the 90s, and that was sort of a semi-acceptable term, except that it instrumentalized Ukrainians and they were frustrated by that. Uh, and now it is very clearly defined as the front line in some you know, grand titanic struggle between good and evil. But the thing is, when you're on the front line, you get obliterated. And, and that, unfortunately, has been the experience of a lot of Ukrainians. Another concern I have about this great powers narrative is, is the longstanding one in United States foreign policy. We're not talking about Africa. We're not talking about Latin America. We're not talking about Central Asia, except in an instrumental way. That, it, this dialogue and this focus of all of our strategy uh, leaves aside much of the world, including parts of it that are developing very rapidly. Uh, about that, uh, you know, one of the criticisms of U.S. mainstream media that holds up to scrutiny often is it can be very myopic, right? The, the issue of the moment and talking about nothing else. So when we're talking about Russia in recent times, we know what we're yeah. talking about is Putin, Trump and yeah. Mueller and impeachment <coughs> and Ukraine and China. It's the trade war. Right. And now the coronavirus has interrupted that for right. a, a moment. Uh, what are some of the specific issues, whether it be competition or cooperation, that are just flying under the radar? Well, I mean, almost every issue other than the ones that we've mentioned so far, uh, including, you know, in what areas do we have to cooperate? And this is, the, the list has become clichéic, uh, but we're still not attending to it. You know, mass species extinction, global warming, pandemics uh, and public health, terrorism, human trafficking, the fact that we are so inextricably linked with each other technologically, cultur culturally and commercially. This great power narrative, especially if it's only understood in a security way, uh, is in danger of sort of buffaloing over all of these other issues. Now, uh, is there some natural momentum there? So when you say public health, obviously there's great motivation to cooperate. But something motivation. like 5G, we're talking about maybe competition. Uh, well, but 5, 5, 5G is a piece of global communications. The 5G is, 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 a, is a technology, but the, the, the global issue and the need for cooperation comes in global trade, global communications of various kinds. I think that that's yeah. the right lens there. And nobody, all nobody is saying there that that's an absolute competition. One, yeah. of, my, one of my favorites uh, with Russia, there, as Robert said, there are many, 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 but one of my favorites is space, right? This, this mm -hmm. should be intuitively clear to anyone who hasn't been uh, either living under a rock or believing in conspiracies for the last 50 years. You know. We have both put people in space. They were the first to put a man in space. We were the first to put a man on the moon. 
right? These are uniquely capable systems in terms of delivering a human future that is not tied just to this terrestrial uh, planet. And that, by the way, has implications for the planet itself as well, including on climate change and communications and everything else that matters for people living here. Um, I am terrified that we are going to throw the baby out with the bathwater in our search to break mutual dependence, which is something we sought to build in the 1970s as a source of stability. Remember Apollo Soyuz, instead of racing into the cosmos with ray guns to blast each other, the idea was we would race into the cosmos together, and we were quite successful at Star that. Trek, not Star Wars. Arguably, yeah. arguably, right, exactly, the Federation of Planets, but uh, nobody here is arguing for world government, I want to be clear on that, <laughs> but, uh, but arguably culminating in the last few years when having canceled our own space shuttle program, we are quite reliably and consistently able to send our astronauts to the International Space Station, where they work hand in hand with Russian cosmonauts and others from around the world, uh, and fly back and forth essentially in Russian delivery and recovery vehicles. And, and that system works. You know, there's a complex billing process for NASA's, it. Right? NASA's Uber. <laughs> right. Uh, Russia. And, and, and I'm, I'm concerned that in our drive to break this interdependence with one another, right, to have our own systems, to lock the Russians out because they're corrupt and they're evil and so on, um, we're going to go right back to the model, which is, you know, space is the next frontier for human warfare. So, uh, always fascinating to speak with both of you. Uh, can you give our viewers and listeners a preview of, of some things you're working on that are coming up in the next year, uh, topics in the area of great powers competition? Well, one of the things that's been very exciting for me about looking at US China and I came here about six and a half years ago and then it was most of our programmatic focus was bilateral and now as this becomes a global uh, competition it is spreading us out in ways that are both very difficult uh, but also very rich and that I think helps us to bring more insights our cooperation it's, it's, it's changed our, our reading it's changed the way that we think about China and it's become a, a global competition such that just you know in the next month I'll be in both uh, Israel and Ireland, primarily trying to understand, and I think this is the first task, understanding views from other countries and views from other regions. We understand the trajectory of American views toward China. There are aspects of them that are necessary, uh, a greater emphasis on security, and aspects that are worrisome, an overemphasis on security. And I suspect uh, that the answer to not getting locked into a new, new Cold War involves increased forms of multilateralism not global governance. Okay. Uh, and so it's necessary to get out, and I think that the next step for the Kissinger Institute, uh, anyway, over the coming year is going to be sort of listening uh, to the world experts who come here, and you know, getting out to, to listen to them on their own uh, turf, and then to cooperate more closely with colleagues, because it's, it's about framing this right, rather than simply accepting uh, fairly shallow, unexamined notions about big power competition, and saying, okay, we're determined to win. One of the great things about the Wilson Center, which I think you highlighted by uh, referring to, we're very proud of our, our third year running as uh, number one in, in the world, ranked by our peers for regional studies, which is, of course, what we both do, what the Kissinger Institute and the Kennan Institute do. And so we work together quite a lot um, since, you know, even if I was just, uh, if I didn't have a bias in favor of my friend Robert and the Kissinger Institute, I was just looking objectively, you know, who's the best on this topic, right? I'd, I'd sign up with these folks. And what that means is we've been able to have incredibly privileged access, um, but also very authentic ground level insight in how folks think in parts of the world who are not usually consulted when the Pentagon is commissioning a piece on great power competition. And so I'll just add to the list, um, besides Israel, uh, where we've worked together to talk about what Russia and China and great power competition mean for the Middle East, um, we've also had uh, a very unusual, and I think first and only of its kind, uh, trilateral conversation among Americans, uh, Russians, and Indians. Uh, about what this specific future promises in a world that is defined in many ways by the politics of the past. And I think that is very promising as well. Well, exciting, dynamic, challenging would just be understatement to talk about your work. And so we're glad to be along for the ride. I look forward to what's coming down the pike. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you. And I should tell all of you listening and, and watching that if you'd like more information on the work of uh, the Kennan Institute or the Kissinger Institute, come to our newly designed website. You can find the tabs for both and also a new tab on these four spotlight issues, one for great powers. Thanks for joining us. Hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center Now and that you'll join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for watching. <laughs>